you are all here for our next theology night. So as you know, if you've been coming to TC for any amount of time, um, we do believe that discipleship, growing in your faith, um, becoming more like Jesus is very important. And as we grow to be more like Jesus and we reflect him, we grow in what we call the five characteristics of a transformer or a disciple. Worship, connect, serve, give, and invite. So how does Theology Night fit into that? Well, it's really important to know what you believe and why you believe it. Because otherwise, how is your faith gonna grow if you don't even know the person that you're believing in, right? And so, or I should say the persons, which we're gonna talk about tonight. So, um, so we're glad you're here. It's an opportunity um, for you guys to hear um, Derwin teach um, on theology. Um, you'll hear things about, um, you, I'm sure he'll share some of his stories, and it's an opportunity. Then we'll have some time at Q&A. We've been collecting questions for the last couple weeks, and so we'll have some time at Q&A. But I'm gonna open us in prayer, and then we will get started. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the um, brisk, chilly weather and the beautiful sunshine. Um, Lord, thank you that we live in a time and in a place where we can come together and we can freely learn about you. We can talk about you. Um, and God, thank you that you want us to know you. Thank you that you have revealed who you are to us through your word and through Jesus. And so, God, um, I pray that as we spend this time tonight learning more about who you are, um, that you will just open our eyes um, to see and our ears to hear and, and for us to just experience um, ultimately how great your love is for us. God, that that would transform us individually and corporately so that we would look more like you and that we would be sent on mission uh, to reach those that are hurting and that don't know you. So God, we give you this time. We ask for your blessing on um, Derwin as he um, shares and teaches. And Lord, I just um, thank you for each person and each family that's represented here tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, okay. amen. Can we, can we give it up to the mother of the house, <laughs> Vicki Gray. <laughs> Vicki Gray in the flesh. <laughs> Vicki and I are looking at each other like this. We've literally been here since... Uh, 9.30 probably. Yeah, it's been one of those awesome, awesome days. Hey, it is so good um, to see everybody. It is great to see uh, the teenagers in the house, the young adults in the house, and the more seasoned, mature, wisdom-haired people in the house. And some of y'all don't have hair, but at the resurrection, you will praise God for that. <laughs> All right, check this out. So, so this is uh, Studying the Attributes of God, part two. The good thing is Every one of the theology nights you can go back and look at on the Transformation Church YouTube channel. And this is the ultimate goal of what we're doing is all of these uh, theology nights are being recorded. And so what we're going to have is eventually an entire systematic theology. It will also have the study questions. And so this has a bigger purpose that we're going to continue to use to disciple our church. Now, Discipleship, uh, teenagers, it literally means a student or an apprentice. We're, we're learning how to follow Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. Now, the thing is, is it's not just cognitive in our minds. Um, what we believe is no good if it stays just in our minds. And so here at TC, Upward, inward, outward, right? Like we love God, it affects us on the inside, then it moves us on the outside. One of the things, say like if you were, um, say, in the military or if you were, uh, for my old world, in professional sports, you don't sit to just listen to a meeting and go, hey, that's good information, okay. You process the information, study the information so you can actually go and live that information. And so, but the way we live it is through the power of God's spirit within us. And so just for review, the attributes of God, 
A.W. Tozier from his book, Knowledge of the Holy, said this. What did he say? What comes into our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. Why is that? It's the most important thing about us because it shapes us. It molds us. And what's beautiful, when we describe God, we're describing God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the one who loves us the most, the uncreated creator who desires our ultimate good, wants us to be shaped by who he is. Next. A right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living. Uh, most followers of Jesus um, don't do what we're doing here. We want to start here, Christian living. But how do I know what I'm living if I don't know the God that I worship? And so we want to flow out of, and systematic theology simply means a system of thought about God. So traditionally, when you get to seminary, this is what you guys are learning to a certain degree, your first systematic theology is called theology proper. It is the nature and person of God. So that's basically what we start doing last year, or last uh, uh, spring, and what we're doing now is theology proper. We're learning who God is is. And then that moves into uh, ecclesiology, studying the church, and pneumatology, studying the spirit, and all those types of things. And so we're doing that so that we can get a grasp of what we believe and why we believe it. Here's why this is so important. And I want to talk to the teenagers. This is super, super important. Listen, teenagers, human beings such as myself are not Jesus. Therefore, your faith has to be in Jesus, not people. There's a lot to today where people say, well, I don't believe anymore because this person, this person, this person, and I respectfully say, that person didn't die for you on the cross. I didn't raise from the dead. Jesus raises from the dead. I'm a follower of Christ, not because of other people, but because that tomb is empty and Christ rose from the dead, and now he lives in me, and he lives in everyone who says that they follow him. Him. And so we want to get the basics of what we believe and why we believe it so that when the storms of doubt come, when the tribulations of life come, when intellectual challenge comes, when, when issues of the will comes that you want to do something that you know God doesn't want you to do, what keeps you rooted is you know him and he knows you. What is an attribute of God? An attribute of God is whatever God has revealed as being true of himself in the Bible. When there are terms like he and him in the Bible, it does not mean that God is a man with male genitalia. That's not what that means. It is an anthropomorphic term, anthropos, man, it is a term that we as human beings can understand. So when it says God is he and him, it is describing just his nature and his person. But the Bible also describes God as a chicken placing us under his wings. So we don't think God is a giant chicken, do we? Right. <laughs> that would be weird. Like, Argh. Now, <clears throat> God, meaning Father, Son, and Spirit, is like Jesus because Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. So something that I'm grabbing more and more and more is this. How beautiful is this? That the living God of the universe says, you want to know what I'm like? I'm going to become one of you in Jesus of Nazareth. And you're going to see the face of God in Jesus. We're going to see what God is like. If you ever want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. If you want to know what human beings can become, look at Jesus, because Jesus is 100% God the Son and 100% man. As man, he is the prototype of what we can become. As eternally God the Son, he shows us the face of the Father. That is a generous and gracious and good God who would do that for us, that we don't have to live in mystery. Where do we get this from? The Apostle Paul in Colossians chapter 1, 
15 through 20, Colossians was written to multi-ethnic churches in Colossae, Jews and Gentiles, people from all types of backgrounds. And there's a lot of things Paul could have told them in chapter 1, but he tells them what's important is who Jesus is. He says this about Christ. He is the image of the invisible God. So our God is spirit. He doesn't have body parts. He, he is spirit. He is invisible. He is the firstborn of all creation. What does this mean, firstborn? This word here in Greek does not mean like Presley Gray is, Jer- is Derwin's firstborn. This Greek word here means preeminent over. It doesn't mean to be created. It's talking about preeminence over creation. And watch what the rest of the scripture says. For everything was created by him. Everything in heaven and on earth. By the way, heaven is not like we get in a spaceship, make a right turn at Pluto. It's all around us, guys. There's an unseen world all around us right now as we speak. Heaven for the Jewish people was synonymous with God's presence. God lives in a domain and a realm beyond ours, and at times the veil is very, very thin. The visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. This is speaking of the angelic realm, the angels. There's different ranks of angels, um, as well as the demonic realm. Uh, Demons used to be angels, uh, but they got bamboozled by Satan. By the way, man, Satan must really be uh, cunning and shrewd. Hey, guys, I got an idea. You know the one who is infinite, all-powerful, and loving, and who created us? We're going to get him out of power and take over. That sounds like a good idea. Let's do that. That's wild, isn't it? All things have been created through him and, watch this now, for him, for him, for him. This shapes a lot of my preaching that God has not gifted you just for you, it's for him and his glory. And when God has made much in your life and in my life, that's when we get supreme joy. Verse 17, he is before all things. So this is speaking of Jesus' eternality. Uh, People will ask this question, um, who created God? No one created God because God is the uncreated creator. If someone created him, that person would be God. He is before all things, and by all things, and by him all things hold together. That is speaking of God's common grace, that God is holding all things together. You think the world is a mess now? If God took his hand off the world, it would even be that much worse. Y'all like, man, he ghetto. Just open it up with his teeth. That's how we learn in San Antonio, so... So I want to pause here, right? And I think this is really important. I can't stay here long. I'm going to dabble, and I'm going to move on. Um, I shared this Sunday. In 1971, when I was born, the Vietnam War was going on. Uh, in the 90s, we had Desert Storm and the War on Terror. And the t- I mean, I have never not known a time when there was not war on planet Earth, okay? Before... Israel, I mean, the, the things that's been happening in Gaza and Israel have been happening a long time. Uh, the wars in certain parts of Africa, Russia, Ukraine. I mean, so as Christians, let's not freak out that there is a war. There's been wars for thousands of years. If you look at the human history, there's wars. Jesus is returning. I don't know when, but when he does, I want him to find me loving and reaching as many lost people as possible instead of speculating when he's coming back. That is the weirdest thing to me. We, I mean, we should be more vigilant about reaching lost people than afraid, like, when is he coming back? It should be like, God, don't come back too soon because I want to reach one more. Now, watch what Paul does here. He goes to us, the body of Christ. He is also the head 
of the body. Every person who follows Jesus is literally a part of his body, the church. The church is not a building, it's a people, although God's people do meet in buildings. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now, this is talking about him being born or resurrected from the dead. Why was Jesus raised from the dead? So that he might come to have first place in everything. This is why theology is important. I promise you for all of us, we're going to be challenged. And when we are challenged, let's remember, he rose from the dead. He has first place. Me feeling like following Jesus is not a prerequisite to me obeying him. Jesus doesn't go, hey, Derwin, you feel like obeying me today? If not, don't worry about it, we good. Hey, Derwin, you feel like having that hard conversation with that person on staff today? Oh, you don't? Don't worry about it, we good. Derwin, you feel like apologizing to your wife because you know you was acting like a donkey butt a minute ago? You don't? Oh, we good. My feelings have no contingency upon following the one who rose from the dead. And the same for you too. Verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. This is the incarnation, y'all. We're getting ready to celebrate Christmas. You know what we're celebrating? God the Son became a man. And through him, to reconcile everything to himself, reconciliation means there was a great divorce and there's a remarriage where the things on earth are things in heaven. The blood of Jesus is not only gonna fix human beings, it's gonna fix this broken world. How? By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The cross of Christ is immense. So if you wanna know what God is like, look at Jesus, because he is the image of the invisible God. So I wanted to lay that foundation for us. Let's look at some of the attributes of God. First, God is love means that love is not what God does, but who God is. Love is not something that God does. Love is who God is. We don't make God loving. God already is loving. All of God's attributes flow from his triune, loving nature. Before time ever began, people go, what was God doing? God was enjoying himself in a celebration of eternal love as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and salvation is an invitation to the celebration. This is what I mean. 1 John 4, 8 through 11, the one who does not love does not know God because God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. Here's the ultimate litmus test of God's love. God sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. That's an invitation into the very life of God. Yes, there's forgiveness of sins, but what good is forgiveness to someone who's dead? Forgiveness is only good to someone who's alive. And so when Jesus forgives us, he makes us alive, and we are alive to participate in the God of love. Now, let me pause here. We live in a culture where people go, well, God is loving, so everything goes. No. If someone breaks in, your, if someone break into my house and want to hurt my wife and kids, uh, I'm a pacifist. I'm a pacifist. because it is loving to protect my family. That's lo it is equally loving for God to say, sin is killing humanity, and I have to isolate it and separate it if it doesn't want to be changed. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Let me move on from here. Let's go to the next one because I'm going to run out of time. Okay, let's look now at the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God means that God is being who he is. He cannot cease to be what he is. He cannot act out of his character. God is faithful through the Son by the Spirit's power to redeem creation and those who have allegiances to Jesus in faith. Now, God being faithful, we have to be careful because we will throw some American dream theology into it and go, God, I lost my job. I thought you were faithful. And he's like, let me look in the scripture where it says, I'm going to make sure you keep your job. <laughs> what if you didn't work good at your job? What if you kept showing up late at your job? 
Or what if you work five years at a job and then the team calls you and say, we don't want to sign you, and you start crying and you call your mentor and you go, the Colts don't want me to play for them anymore. And your mentor goes, praise God. And I said, no, they don't want me. He goes, I know, praise God. Because when God closes one door, he opens another door. And before you know it, I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina. But then, but then I'm on the team and I hurt my knee and I can't play the rest of the year. Is God not faithful? He's very faithful. You know why? Because all I did was study my Bible for the whole year and rehab my knee. They paid me $500, $500,000 to read the Bible. I think God is very faithful. And a lot of that was used to sit in the seats where you're sitting at right now. God is faithful. Listen, young people, even when you can't see it, trust him. When you can't see his hand, trust his heart. He is faithful and he is good and he is moving when you can't even see it. He's faithful. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. Uh, can you go back? Thank you. In him we have received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. God is always working and moving even when we can't see it. Have you guys um, ever seen someone um, working on a carpet? And so when they're working on it and you look at it, it looks like a mess, but then they turn it around and the carpet is beautiful. A lot of times our lives look like a mess and then God turns it around and you go, oh, now I see. It's easy to be faithful when everything looks good. One of the ways that you know that you're walking with the Lord is when the situation don't look good, but you trust him because he's good and faithful. Now let's look at the next attribute, the goodness of God. The goodness of God is that which moves his heart to be kind, affectionate, and benevolent towards humanity. Our triune God takes pleasure in our happiness. So let's pause here. Um, and teenagers, I want you to dial in young adults, right? And this is a basic question, but we have to answer it more and more and more because it's important. If God is good, then why is Gaza being bombed? Why was 1,400 Jewish people massacred? Why is there so much evil and brokenness in the world? And it's not because of God, it's because of people. God was very clear, hey, love me and love your neighbors, you love yourself. When you don't, bad stuff's gonna happen. One of the things that God gave us is free agency or free will. And so we use that agency to do horrible things. And I'm so glad God didn't say, you know what, guys? Y'all are a mess. I'm done. No, he stepped into human history as a poor peasant Jew and said, I've come to heal the world by being wounded. I've come to die so you can stop killing each other and live. So keep that in mind when someone goes, well, if God is good, then why is there so much evil? And God is not responsible for it. We are. The Lord is good to everyone. His compassion rests on all he has made. Another thing, too, when Jesus was on the cross, he felt every ounce of all the suffering every human being would ever feel. The scripture says in Hebrews 4 that we have a high priest who can relate to us in every single way. So think of all the pain you've experienced and then multiply every person who's ever lived and at one place, at one time in history, all that fell on Jesus. But God proved his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? Watch this. 
For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more having been reconciled will we be saved by his life? And so Jesus enters into our pain, takes our place, experiences our brokenness, dies a sinner's death, raises in glory. And he says, now I want to invite you into my life so you can be light in the darkness. Friends, As crazy and chaotic as the world is, people are going to listen to the message of Jesus. Not from jerks, though, but from loving, kind people. I don't understand how some Christians think that picketing people is going to make them fall to their knees and follow Christ. Oh, you're so mean and cruel. Let me follow Jesus now. Do you guys remember Jesus ever picketing anybody in the New Testament? The only people he went off on were the religious Pharisees. How do we mix, how do we mess that up? How how is someone going to come to Christ's love if I'm a jerk? Come to Jesus and be mean like me. Hey, I'm so grateful that when I was a cussing fool, that the naked preacher in the Indianapolis Colts locker room didn't go, man, this dude too far gone. He was patient with me. He loved me. He prayed for me. When I went through stuff, he was there. He didn't pick at me. He loved me. It is the kindness of God that leads to repentance, Romans chapter 2, verse 5. For the Lord, your God, is is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight with you with gladness. With his love, he will calm your fears. Woo, Christians, we need this. Um, I know a lot of your friends that don't attend Transformation Church, they are scared, scared, scared. The world's ending and this is going to happen. Like, let's say the world is ending. Shouldn't we be happy? Oh, no, persecution's going to come. Well, if you put me in jail, guess who I'm going to tell you about? Jesus. If you kill me, guess who I'm going to be with? Jesus. It's a win-win situation. With his love, he will calm your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. This is talking to the nation of Israel, but through Christ, the true and better Israel, it applies to those of us in Christ that we have a father who rejoices and sings over us with his mighty love, even in the midst of the brokenness. Let's now move on to the justice of God. The justice of God is the name we give to the way God is. Our triune God is morally upright and fair. God is upright and fair. Now, sometimes we don't understand his fairness. There's sometimes I go, Lord, why you let these TV preachers stay on TV taking all these people money? That ain't the Bible. And he's like, well... Next time I need your advice, Derwin, I will send you an email. <laughs> He's like, you, do, you, you handle the people I've called you to shepherd. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> the righteousness. So God himself is just and righteous. His righteousness is how he's going to put the world back together again. So let's do now, let's move from systematic theology to a little biblical theology, okay? So in biblical theology, we have this amazing event called the Exodus. The children of Israel got to Egypt because of Joseph. The people were starving. Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. It's messed up. But what the enemy means for evil, God turns into good. Joseph is in second in command. The starving, fledgling Jewish nation comes into Egypt, and guess where they go? They go to the land of Goshen, and the Egyptians were like, ooh, you guys are with sheep. That's gross. Y'all just stay there. They grew, they grew, they grew. The old Pharaoh dies. A new one comes in and goes, whoo, look at all this free labor. So let's pause here. Please understand, slavery did not start in the United States of America. Let me say that again. Slavery did not start in the United States of America. As long as people have been alive, there has been injust and slavery. The British would enslave the Irish. Oh, my gosh, don't even let me get to the Baltic countries. Oh, gosh. 
uh, we heard a story in Germany where um, the Russians kidnapped some Germans, took them to Siberia, made them build tr uh, uh, railroad tracks and fed them cigarettes, vodka, and beer. No, no, uh, no, cigarettes, vodka, and bread. So I'm saying that if we're not careful, particularly us as black Americans, we'll think we're the only ones that have gone through slavery, and we won't say nothing about the African tribes who sold other Africans to the Portuguese. Sin is a sin is a sin is a sin regardless. That's why we've got to be people of the cross. God's justice, so Israel gets set free because of the Passover, the blood is over the door, the children of Israel, they running through the Red Sea, it was glorious and all this stuff, right? Then God says in Exodus 20, I am the Lord your God who freed you from slavery in Egypt, therefore have no other gods before me, and it goes into the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal with loving God. The next six commandments deal with loving your neighbors, you love yourself. So upward, inward, outward was God's idea of how to heal a broken world. That was his justice. That was his righteousness. Israel had that job, and they utterly blew it. Instead of reaching the Gentiles, they became like the Gentiles. But what does God do? God don't give up. He goes, oh, yeah, we got a suffering servant that's going to come. King Jesus is going to come, and he is truly going to live upward, inward, outward. Jesus' life is the justice and righteousness of God that is going to heal the world, and you and I get invited into it. But how do we get it? By grace. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ who all believe. The life Jesus lived is given to us as a gift. Friends, that is epic. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. One of the way Paul overcame racism in the early church is by saying, listen, Greek people, how can you look down upon Jews when they're as righteous as you are? Jews, how can you look down on the Africans when they're as righteous as you are? What if we as God's people looked at each other instead of as Republicans and Democrats or whatever, but as the righteousness of God? And what if I'm prejudiced against you and you're prejudiced against me, we're being prejudiced against Jesus because it's Jesus' his righteousness that we're ignoring. That's how Paul built multi-ethnic churches. We make it so difficult. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely, righteousness, by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. For God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. Teenagers, the word atonement means to smear or wipe over one time a year on Yom Kippur, the Jewish high priest would go into the holies of holies where God's presence was, and he would pour the blood of an unblemished lamb over the mercy seat where the Ten Commandments were, and that was to atone or wipe over the people's sins. And so Jesus is our eternal day of atonement. Our sins are wiped away, forgiven, forgotten, through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith, received by faith. Not received by good effort, received by faith. We are people that live by faith. Not faith in our faith, but faith in Jesus. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness or justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. I'm going fast, but I'm about to hit the brakes and put it in park. I hope you caught this. Look how beautiful our God is. He is just. He's like, because I love you, I have to deal with this cancer called sin. I gotta deal with it or I wouldn't be loving. But guess what? The way I'm going to deal with it is by giving the righteousness of my son to you. Wow. That is utterly epic. So he is just. He is faithful. Um, sometimes when I'm in conversation with people, 
and uh, they may come from more of a progressive or left-leaning political perspective. It's like, I want justice, 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 justice. But if God wants justice, they go, ooh, that's a bad God. Wait, it's like, you want justice, but if God wants justice, he's bad. So you good when you want justice, but God is bad when he wants justice. Uh. <laughs> the mercy of God. Teenagers, the mercy of God is his infinite and inexhaustible energy within the divine nature which moves him to be actively compassionate to us. Here's something that will change your disposition in, in, in mind. When you wake up in the morning, thank him for oxygen. So you know it doesn't have to be this way, right? Like, like when you look at planet Earth, in our solar system, in our galaxy, it doesn't have to be this way. The Earth and our galaxy is at a such a pinpoint precision that if anything was off a little bit, we wouldn't exist. As a matter of fact, physicists say that we live in the Goldilocks arm of the Milky Way galaxy where life just happens to be, where creation just happens to be perfect for humans to exist. So like when you breathe or you see the sun, like be grateful because it doesn't have to be that way. He's merciful to us in a multitude of ways. Now let's look at the grace of God. The grace of God is the good pleasure, is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits upon the undeserving. Wow. Think about that for a minute. The grace of God, the grace of God, that God himself meets us, not only in the moment of salvation, but in every single thing. Have you thought about how throughout human history, how we actually got to this place, all of the inventions and all the just go back, go back, go back, and how medicines were discovered and all types of stuff? It is sheer grace. Like, even me standing here today. So I can only tra chase my, uh, uh, trace my genealogy to my fourth great-grandfather, who fought in the Civil War, by the way, for the good guys. Uh, <laughs> some of y'all like, <laughs> <laughs> no, really, for the good guys. Um, and then it, it stops there. But I would be curious, like, the... The 21% of me that's European, I wonder who those people were. I wonder what their story was. And then the different African groups that, you know, the Nigerian and West, I mean, like, who are these people? I mean, that's all. It didn't have to be here. Wow, that's for all of us. Pretty exquisite. But the grace of God seen in the salvific work of Jesus is simply awesome. Teenagers, mercy is God's goodness confronting human misery and guilt. Grace is his goodness directed towards human sin and suffering. I think Tozier, I took that from Tozier and put it together there for us. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. This is speaking of the human condition. Paul specifically is talking to the churches at Ephesus. And he's trying to get these people, listen now, for the early church, salvation would have never been, woo, I want to escape earth and go to heaven. It would have been, how does the kingdom of God come to earth now? And then it would have never been, hey, what's your dreams? God wants to heal your dreams. It would have been, wow, how do we get in alignment to the assignment of bringing the kingdom to earth? One of my hardest jobs as a preacher is to rewire your minds every Sunday to towards the kingdom instead of self. The natural gravitational pull is, what can I get out of this? Instead of, wait a second, I've been drafted into the kingdom of God who now exists for the glory of God. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit working in disobedience. So 
verses one, two, and three is a pretty dim perspective of every single human being, that this is all of us. So you know what that means? Humility. We were all too previously lived, um, we all too previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. So without Jesus, we are under judgment. Now, we live in a day and age where people go, well, no, there's no such thing as judgment. But in every factor of life, there is. Case in point, uh, for some of you, you have, for, you, you have beautiful wives, handsome husbands, but there was a judgment day to see if you qualified to get them. Henry, I know your dad is handsome. Like, look at him. He's just handsome. He's smiling right there. <laughs> But he had to impress your mom. It wasn't like she's like, hey, I just like you. Amen. (laughs) What's his mother tongue? Estonian, yes. So he probably don't understand half of what I'm saying, but it's cool though. (laughs) Um, Even to get my wife, there was a judgment day. Do you pass the test? In school, do you pass the test? At work, do you pass the test? Do you pass the test? There's only one test We can never pass, but God passed it for us. Watch this now. I love this, but God, man. Now that right there is a great mission statement for life, but God. Who is what? Rich in mercy because of what? His great love that he had for us. Do you guys know who the rapper Little John is? What? Okay. I mean, I'm a priest just like Lil John, but God who is rich in mercy. Okay, because of his great love that he had for us. What? Watch this now, verse five. He made us what? Alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our trespasses and sins. (laughs) And that wasn't a teenager. How old are you? 67, young at heart. Yeah! (laughs) Here we go. You are saved by grace. Verse 6, he also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. Right now, we're seated with Jesus in the throne room of God, yet we're here, meaning Christ is in us. Why? So that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Let me give it to you in the Derwin Gray translation, verse 7. God is so gracious that he displays you and I to the angelic and demonic realm and say, look how great my grace is. Look what I have done. I have saved them. I have forgiven them. God presents you to heaven going, look what I have done. Man, and we got the audacity to have low self-esteem. We don't need self-esteem. We need God esteem. Verse 8, for you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship, that's the Greek word ponia, where we get palm, that, that we are God's palm of grace, his living poetry. Here's this big word, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So grace, we're saved by grace alone, but our, work, but our grace never leaves us to not have works. Our works is God working out his grace through us, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. God is incredibly gracious. Now, by the way, I am going warp speed, okay? So the purpose of these notes is for you to study them The purpose of this being recorded is so you can look at it over and over. The holiness of God is the way God is. To be holy means that he does not conform to a standard. He is the standard. That's bars. A.W. Tozer. He is holy with an infinite, 
incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than it is. Well, 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 well. Because God is holy, you can trust him. He can't lie. He will not lie. Now, trusting him and understanding what's happening is two different categories. I don't have to understand what's happening to trust him because he's holy and he's good. That's why all these attributes are good. So way back in like 2000, oh my gosh, probably 2002, 2003, maybe even sooner than that, um, I got a physical and it showed that my uh, kidney labs were high and we did some other tests. And uh, I got the results back. This is in the early days of ministry. I was in Florida at a teen camp and I got the results back. And by the time I read them on my phone, um, I was in the jungle somewhere where this camp was and we had no communication with nothing. And it was like, you may have a serious problem. And so I didn't know like how much time I had or didn't have. And that whole night, and I couldn't call my wife on the phone, I literally curled up with the Bible and wept and cried. And I said, Lord, I don't know how much time I have, but I, this I do, do know. You are love, you are good, you are faithful, and I can trust you regardless of what happens. And then the other thing was, if you're going to plant this church, you better hurry up and do it. Obviously, I'm healthy as a bull. I'm doing great. But that moment, man, was a, do you trust him or not? Like, you can't see through the fog, but you know the one who does. And are you willing to hold his nail-pierced hands in the midst of it? And all of us are going to come to that. Because God is holy, we can trust him. Isaiah chapter 6 <clears throat> Verses one through eight. Teenagers, this is when Isaiah the prophet was in the temple and he gets an incredible glimpse of Jesus. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne and the hem of his robe filled the temple. For the Jewish people, the temple was where the presence of God was. Seraphim were standing above him. Those are these beautiful angels. They each had six wings, with two covered their faces, with two covered their feet, and with two they flew. So this is a wild scene. And one called to the another, bro, this is so epic. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. Um, have you guys, I don't, I don't know if they do this anymore like at high school games, but it's a home game and one side's here and they're like, we got spirit. Yes, we do. We got spirit. How about you? That's what the angels were doing. There's like, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. I mean, can you imagine their voices and it's booming and it's glorious. It's unlike anything that we've ever seen. It was so epic. The foundations of the doorway shook at the sound of their voices and the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, look what Isaiah says. There's a lot of people like, man, when I see God, you know what I'm going to do? Shut up. You ain't going to do nothing but fall down at your face. <laughs> and so am I. Like, I'm going to tell God something. No, you're not. <laughs> Isaiah says, woe is me. That word woe in Hebrew is not like woe. It literally means I'm unraveling. Woe is me for I am ruined. No, no, no I'm sorry. The word ruin means unraveling, because I'm a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, whoo, Lord have mercy, the Lord of armies, then, watch the grace, family, watch the grace, then one of the seraphim flew to me, and in his hand was a glowing coal that it was taken from the altar with tongues. He touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your inequity is removed and your sin is atoned for. You see the grace? Here's a holy and beautiful God. Isaiah can't approach him. Isaiah is a sinful man amongst a sinful people. And what does a loving God do? He goes to him to forgive him so relationship can be restored. Then I heard the voice of the Lord asking, who will I send? Who will go for us? 
here I am, send me. You see the upward, the inward, the outward? That's the response. This is why we're doing theology is so we're sent on mission because the world needs to know there's a good and faithful God of infinite beauty. Hebrews 2, 11 through 15, both the one who makes people holy, hello, hello, God makes us holy, and those who are made holy are the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. It's speaking of our humanity. Jesus is our brother in humanity. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am, and the children of God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared their humanity. This is speaking of the incarnation of Christ. He too shared their humanity so that by his death, he may break the power of him who holds the power of death. Oh, my goodness. Well, if I wasn't so tired, I would do a little mini sermon right now, but a brother's tired, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> Think about it. He might break the power of the one who holds death. This is perfect for our series on spiritual warfare. I keep telling us, everybody, if Christ is in you, we are not weaklings. We're not to fear the dark powers. They should fear and tremble us because greater is he who is in us than is in the world. You have power in Christ. You are not a weakling. You are strong in him. Believe it and receive it and live it. Even when you don't feel it. <laughs> that is the devil, and free all those whose lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. So, man, now that we got freed, it's time for us to go free some people. Can I challenge you with this? Um, I don't know if you notice, but I have a whole different level of urgency about reaching lost people. I park at the Starbucks a couple times a week to reach lost people. I want to make sure that you're coming to theology nights to get equipped so you too can reach lost people. If all of your friends are Christians, you need some new friends. <laughs> Preferably ones that cuss like pirates. <laughs> what? <laughs> you do. You need some lost people. I tell you, one of the coolest things is when I'm at Starbucks and uh, I'm praying for somebody and they have no clue who Christ is, and after I pray, they got tears in their eyes and they cuss. It's amazing. <laughs> they, don't even know what, they don't even know what's going on. Like, I, I want to encourage you, get out of your bubble. Like, what you have is too important. Think about it. Just as everybody in this room, if we reached one person, just every one of us reached one person a year, you know how many people that is? <laughs> That's my wife over there. She's like, you better hurry up. Uh, the sovereignty of God is the attribute by which he rules his entire creation. And to be sovereign means you're all-knowing. So nothing catches God by surprise. Here, let's bake our noodles with this. God not only knows what will happen, but what could possibly happen in every scenario that is possible. Not only is he all-knowing, God is all-powerful. Now keep in mind, all-powerful doesn't mean God does contradictions because that's a lie. God can't make square circles because that's a contradiction. God being all-powerful means he's not gonna make you do something, but he will take even your rebellion and my rebellion and lost people's rebellion to work out his glory. We plan checkers, God is playing infinite chess. And God is absolutely free. What does that mean? It means the decisions he makes are rooted in his very own character. He's all powerful, he's all knowing, he's all loving, he is sovereign. For God to be sovereign doesn't mean that we are robots. It means that even within his sovereignty, we have the capacity to make choices. <laughs> I wanted to hit this because I know this is a question we always get. I've touched on it. If God is sovereign, meaning he's in control, what about evil? Romans 8, 28 through 30, specifically to believers. 
And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good. Friends, there have been some things that have just been horrendous that God has worked out for the good. I mean, gut-wrenching, on your bedroom floor, all night, snotty-nosed tears, afraid, and then God worked it out. Wasn't pain-free, but he worked it out. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, you ready, to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn many brothers and sisters. So in his humanity, Jesus is the firstborn to be raised from the dead. And because we're attached to him by faith, we're a part of this new family of the resurrection where there's a sovereign God who is working all things out, even the most difficult and hard things. One of the things I want to encourage us with, because if I could collect everybody's pain and you could collect my pain, there would be a lot of pain here. And one of the things that the dark powers of evil love to do is to re-hurt you from pain that already happened. And at that point, it's important for us to take our pain and our brokenness and be honest about it with Jesus. Mourn the abuse, mourn the neglect, mourn it, but don't stay there. Allow the resurrection power to reshape that. Um, my dad was not involved in my life, substance abuse, mental health issues, and I didn't want that to be my forever soul tattoo and definition. By faith, I believe Jesus defines me, and I want to be a great father and a great husband um, for the glory of God. Now, teenagers, please understand this. And my kids have let me know very clear, Dad, you're awesome, uh, but you made some mistakes. One of the most powerful things I've ever done to my kids is say this, I'm sorry I was wrong. I'm sorry I was wrong. Um, please, please do that. And teenagers, for those of you going, amen, your kids are going to be in therapy because of you too. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a joke, kind of. <laughs> All right, am I done? Let me see. Yeah, I think I'm done. I mean, we'll, we, we got that, we good. All right, let's go, because we're running out of time. Uh, nope, we ain't gonna do that one. Y'all wanna, y'all wanna do th this one, the salvation, or do you wanna go to Q&A? Okay, what we got? Uh, hands, hands for Q&A, raise them up. Hands to discuss if God is sovereign. Uh, what about salvation? Hands up. Oh, gosh. Okay, really quick. What? No, you can stay up here. You can help me. What? The first one won. The Q&A. I know. That was pointless? Yes, go. Oh, no. go. She said it's pointless. I ain't done it. I'm picking up my toys and going home. So within Christian history, I'm going to give you two primary views. There are Christians who believe that before the salvations of the earth, God elected who would be saved. So everybody that comes to faith is because God eternally elected those people to believe, and those who do not believe, he has chosen to leave them in their sin. That view is called Calvinism or Lutheranism or Reformed. There's another view uh, after a guy named Jacob Arminius around the same time, and his view was, no, um, God knows who's going to believe, and salvation is offered to all people, and the Holy Spirit frees their will to believe, so God is still sovereign in that they believe or reject, but God still initiates. Now, some Arminians believe you can lose your salvation. Our perspective here at Transformation Church is we believe Jesus Christ himself is the elect one. Before time ever began, God the Father elected Jesus to be the Savior of the world, and all those who have faith in him enter into him. You can only have faith in him because the Holy Spirit frees your will to believe, and once you're in Christ, you are eternally in Christ. That's what we believe, or that's what I believe. Anyway, I don't know what y'all believe, but that's what I believe. 
Yes, that's what we believe. Yes. <laughs> Okay. But there's room for uh, those of you who have another perspective on it. It's a secondary issue. Are you ready? I'm ready. That was amazing. Thank you. I appreciate it. So you, this is what happens at our house. Like, walk it around, like, just, and I'll be hmm. like, can I get coffee? And then we'll talk. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, okay, hold on. Oh. That's half the story. <laughs> okay, Transformation Church, there's always two sides to the story. So typically, she gets up earlier than I do. And once her mind gets going, she, work, she wants to work out the thoughts. But I need coffee before I can begin to entertain the thoughts. Okay. And so you be getting me in the morning. Yeah. Oh, but you get me at night. That's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Are you <still>? oh. <laughs> That's true. He, and our yeah. son is like her and our yeah. daughter is like me. Yeah. So, you know. So we be getting each spiritual other. Spiritual formation. It's spiritual yes. formation. You got yes. a lot of patience. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Anyways, that was amazing. Your mom be doing that too. I know. <laughs> Maybe that's where you got it from. <laughs> Somebody do some of him. <laughs> Look it. Y'all, we have too much fun. Um, no, that was incredible teaching. And it is a lot of information. So please take your time to go through the scriptures at home and notes. And you have to like wrestle with it, right? To make it your own. Mm -hmm. And so, but these are things that impact your life on a daily basis, whether we realize it or not. So yeah. there are a few questions that we have gotten over the last couple of weeks. Okay. And I kind of tried to go in order, but I thought this one was amazing. This was a question submitted um, from a nine-year-old. Mm -hmm. Why does God stay invisible? That's a great question. Why does God stay invisible? visible. So God in his nature, the Bible says that God is spirit. So my late mentor, Dr. Norman Geisler, taught me theology proper. So because God is infinite, infinite means you can't categorize it. So if God had a body, it, would, it couldn't be infinite. Things that are material are finite. And so God is immaterial, so he is infinite, but God did not stay invisible. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus came to show us what God looks like. And now God shows himself through the body of Christ, through you and me. That's why our transformation is so important is God said, okay, I'm gonna show the world through my people now. And primarily, the world sees him how? You will know my disciples because they argue on Facebook. <laughs> because they love one another. That's a great question. Yeah. Nine-year-old. Wow. A nine-year-old, yeah. Um, okay, well, in talking about the Trinity, and you talked about how um, Jesus is the visible representation of the invisible Father. So let's ask this one. Is there a spiritual order of authority within the Trinity? How does the Trinity all work together? Yes. Uh, just recently in the last 25 years of biblical scholarship, um, there has been this, well, there has to be a hierarchy in the Trinity where the Father is above the Son and the Son is above the Holy Spirit. Um, I disagree with that. Um, I believe that in the Bible, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal, co-eternal. They have different roles within the application, but there is no higher rank within the triune nature of God. Now, please understand this. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and the Spirit is not the Son or the Father. Three distinct persons who share one eternal being. So think about a triangle. A triangle has three points. If you take the triangle, uh, one of the points away, it's no longer a triangle. Well, God reveals himself as one being who is Father, Son, and Spirit. And why is that important, family? If the Bible says God is love and he's one person, who is he loving? Love requires community. So the Father is the lover, the Son is the lovee, and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of love that binds them together, and then we get to participate in that love. I hope you know, guys, the sermons I preach are laced with theology. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it really is. 
Like it is laced with theology because we have to have theological roots or when the great storms come, we're just gonna be just lifted up. I mean, there's gonna, teenagers, I promise you, there's gonna come a dark night of the soul where you have to choose, do I really believe Jesus is who he says he is? Do I really believe this is the word of God? Do I really believe this? And the greater your roots are in theology, the greater you'll be able to stand. Um, I think there's a lot of people deconstructing, quote unquote, their faith. I don't know if you see that on TikTok. People, I'm deconstructing my faith. Sometimes I talk to these people and they tell me what they're deconstructing from. And I'm like, well, I don't believe in that God either. They're like leaving something that ain't even Jesus. Because, and I hear my heart, most churches don't teach theology. They teach actions and behaviors, where our actions and behaviors have to flow from who God is, upward, inward, then outward. Which is why we do theology nights, is because you have to know who God actually is. Amen. Amen. And if God didn't want us to know who he is, he wouldn't have wrote that big old Bible. Yeah. Yep. Okay, well, talking about studying theology, how do you study theology without letting it overtake the value of intimacy with God? Yeah, you know, that's a difficult question for me to answer because I don't know how you could study about God and not want to be intimate with God. That would be like me studying my wife and not wanting to know her more personally. I think what happens is the dark powers get in and we think knowing something is actually living something. James 1.22 says, be a doer of the word, not merely a listener of the word, deceiving yourselves. And so um, the more we study theology, right, the Apostle Paul says, and I, Philippians 3.8, I consider all things as lost compared to the passing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I consider all things as dung is what he says compared to knowing Christ Jesus, my, my Lord. And, and so our study of theology should move us to love him more, not less. Now, in John chapter 5, 39, uh, yeah, John chapter 5, 39 through 40, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And by the age of 12, Transformation Church, Pharisees had to know from Genesis to Malachi. Not word for word, but they had to know the ends of it or they could not advance. So Pharisees were very studious in the Torah, in the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And Jesus tells them, you study the scriptures diligently because you think in them is eternal life, but the scriptures testify to me. I don't know if you've noticed, but when I preach and teach, Jesus is the highlight of the sermon regardless of any text. Yes, amen. Okay, um, what aspect of God's character should be the first one shared with non-believers? What do you think? <laughs> well, I don't know that I could give a formula. For me, it would be based on where that person is. Mm -hmm. um, it may be somebody that is, um, just feels like God hates them, maybe mm -hmm. because of their past sin or something. And I would probably start with God is love. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I, for me, I would say it really depends on just where that person is. Yeah, and I would agree, agree, agree with that. I think there's a bigger principle here at play. Before I know what to say about a person and the attributes of God, I need to know that person. I think a lot of times we as Christians are so quick to talk, 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 talk. What if you went to the doctor Doctor walks into the room and just starts prescribing medicine, and you don't know any of the symptoms. He don't know anything about you. You know what I mean? So when you listen to a person's story, you begin to hear their pain points. You begin to hear their hurts. You begin to hear their needs, and we see that with Jesus. With the woman at the well, Jesus is waiting at the well. He doesn't say, hello, woman, you harlot. You're such a sinner. Now he's like, hey, uh, can I have some water? And she's like, wait a minute, you're a Jew. 
you don't ask us Gentiles, and I'm a woman, and you want water? Well, if you knew the water I give, you'd never be thirsty again. Well, give me some of that water. Well, go get your five husbands. Hello. So be a better listener. My grandmother taught me this. Dewey, you got two ears and one mouth for a reason. Listen more than you talk. So we got to listen to people's stories, then we can apply the beauty of the gospel to where they are. And by the way, people want to share their hurts and pains, y'all. They really do. They just don't want to be bombarded by jerks. Like, don't be so fast to try to put the fish in the boat. That's good. Thank you, babe. Yes. Okay, well, along those lines, let's say you're having a conversation with somebody who's Muslim. Mm -hmm. How would you explain the character of God to a Muslim since Muslims believe that Jesus is a prophet and is not God? Yeah. Okay, so that's a really, really good question. And we're going to have more people in the United States of America of the Muslim faith. Okay? A couple things. What we're seeing right now in countries like Iran, Iraq, all over the Middle East is we're seeing Muslims come to faith in Jesus, not because of missionaries, but because Jesus is coming to them in dreams. Uh, when we were in Berlin, we met a young lady. Um, she was a Kurd from um, Iraq. And uh, no, one, Iran? Iran, I think. Maybe. Oh, one of them. Yeah, one. I'm sorry if I messed it up. Yeah, I think it was Iran. And uh, she was a Muslim, and Jesus came to her twice in dreams, and now she goes throughout Europe sharing the gospel. Uh, Naeem Fazal, who's a pastor in North Charlotte, a church called Mosaic, came from Pakistan, and when he came to America, his brother became a Christian, and he was going to kill him. So when he went to bed, a dark, dark spirit came into the room, and he couldn't move, and all he could say was Jesus. A bright light that was full of love came into the room. He woke up the next day, said, I'm going to be a Christian, and I'm going to be a pastor. So stories are important. Theologically, Muslims believe in what's called a solitary monotheism. They don't believe that God is triune. They believe that Allah is, is one. They also believe that Allah is deterministic. So you'll, say, you'll hear them say, insha Allah, which means, you know, God's will, if God wills it. Because they believe Allah's playing chess with their life. There's no assurance of any form of salvation. They have great respect for Jesus as a prophet, but they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God because when we say Trinity, what they're thinking is God the Father had sexual relations with Mary, and that's not what we're saying at all. And so I think the place you start with is you say, hey, why don't we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John together and see who Jesus said that he is? Then you want to try to have them in the power of Christian community where there is love and where there is forgiveness and where there is mercy. Now, as conversations begin to move on a, a little bit, there's some other questions that we have to ask, right? There's not very many, if any, democracies in the Middle East, and so that worldview doesn't lend to a lot of aspects of freedom and aspects of with women um, as well, right? But with the nature and character of God, uh, there's no greater place than to start with the person of Jesus because they do have respect for him as a prophet. We believe that he's not just a prophet. We believe he's eternally um, the son of God. But one thing for sure that's not going to work is insulting. <laughs> Yeah. Are we done? Yeah, that oh, was good. I, yeah, that I was, was good. Well, I, I thought okay. you were going to say something No, no, else. I was, we'll I was like, I'm done. Okay. You want to say something? No, that was good. Okay. <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> we are out of time. Uh, thank you again for coming tonight. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> Great job. Thank you for pouring out your wisdom on us. As a reminder, all the Theology Night videos are available on our YouTube channel. And... Um, yeah, I think we're ready to pray and close, and then we got to do our benediction. benediction. Okay. Yeah. Let's pray, family. Okay.
Uh, Father, in Jesus' name, you're epic and you're beautiful and you're great. Thank you for revealing us, revealing to us who you are through your inspired and errant word of God. May we be a people that love deeply because we're deeply loved. May we be a people of worship because you're so good. And may we be a people of mission to reach the lost because you came to seek and save the lost. Bless everyone in Jesus' name. Amen.